Currently underway. There we are. Welcome all the ships at sea. All right, sorry about that. It just dawned on me. So he establishes authority, first of all, over what you might call the visible world, over nature. This authority is not simply over human nature, but over the entire cosmos. So when this one can stand up and address the storm, and it immediately minds him, you see, that stands for the idea that this is the one who is sovereign over the entire created order. Then he encounters this man who's possessed of a thousand demons, legion. And they are terrified by him and plead with him, please don't send us into the abyss. They obviously are utterly at his disposal. He can command them as he will. There's no contest here in the power between these two. And that stands for his authority over the unseen world. So it's his power over the visible creation and then his power over the invisible domains of darkness, angels and demons, principalities, powers, mights, dominions, as Paul would later say. And then the last story is really two stories combined, and I'm calling this his authority in the church. And this is this remarkable little account that we have this morning, which is two miracles intertwined. The one is the synagogue ruler, Jairus, coming to Jesus because of his concern and indeed fear for his daughter, who was at the point of death. And at the same time, he's interrupted in his trip to the synagogue ruler's house by a woman who just reaches out and touches the hem of his garment, hoping for healing. And those two stories are intentionally joined together, not just because they happen together historically, but because they stand, in a sense, for the great ministry of the church. Let me put it this way. The great exercise of the power of Christ or the authority of Christ in the church, which takes place in a twofold way, word and touch. And in a sense, we have two healing accounts, one from his word, one from his touch. And those taken together tell us of the authority of Christ, especially among his people. And so that's, uh, I think, what's going on here. Uh, I'm leaving off any reference to where it goes from here. We do move next week into chapter 9. And even though there have been skeptics in the room, I'm just going to remind you, we are going to make it. We have three more weeks, at least. And in those three weeks, we will reach the point that I had promised we would. So, neener, neener, you know. (laughs) But anyway, today we are covering, finishing chapter 8. And let's look at it. It's chapter 8 of Luke, beginning at verse 40. And we'll read down to the end of the chapter. This is the word of God. As Jesus was returning, he was warmly received by the crowd. For they were all waiting expectantly for him. And look, there came a man named Jairus, and this one was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling before the feet of Jesus, he pled with him to come into his house, because his daughter, his only child, who was only 12 years old, was at the point of death. As Jesus was following, the crowd pressed in on him. And a woman, having a flow of blood for some 12 years, and not able by anyone to be healed, came to him from behind and touched the hem of his garment. And immediately the flow of her blood was stopped. Jesus said, who touched me? Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, the crowd is pressing and thronging you. But Jesus said, someone touched me because I felt power go out from me. The woman, seeing that she could not be hid, trembling, came and falling at the feet of Jesus, explained why she had touched him and how she had been healed immediately. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go into peace. 
While he was yet speaking, someone came from the synagogue ruler's house saying, your daughter is dead. No longer trouble the teacher. But Jesus answered and said to him, do not fear, only believe, and she will be saved. Entering the house, he did not permit anyone to go with him except Peter and James and John and the father of the child and the mother. They, everyone was weeping and wailing for her, but he said, do not weep. She is not dead, but only sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. He took the child by the hand and said, child, arise. And immediately her spirit returned, and she stood up, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. Her parents were absolutely stunned with joy. But he said to them, don't tell anyone about what has happened. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there it is. All right, well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll take a look at this. Our Father, we are grateful for these wonderful stories and how they have encouraged your people, the millions of them who have reviewed them and found in them such encouragement. And our prayer this morning is that as we reflect one more time on the meanings that are communicated to us through these accounts, that you would give us the same encouragement and help us to know that you reach us through your word and through your touch. We give you thanks for it in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, verse 40, as he was returning, as Jesus was returning, the crowd warmly received him. It's really the sense of the word. It's an enthusiastic reception of him uh, because they were waiting for him expectantly, is the idea. This, of course, is to stand in contrast with the experience Jesus had last time we were together when the folks over in the Gadarene region asked him to leave, you see. No warm reception there. They didn't like Jesus. He was upsetting the apple cart. He was disturbing their economic uh, situation. This guy was putting people ahead of property. We can't have that, you know, and so they don't want Jesus to hang around. Would you please leave? And, of course, Jesus accommodates that request. Jesus is not one to force his word down people's throats. You want him to leave, he'll leave, you know, and so he does. Uh, one commentator said, this is a good word of encouragement for everybody who is in Christian ministry. Sometimes you'll be dealing with people who are receptive, and sometimes you'll be dealing with those who aren't. And when you're dealing with people that don't want to hear it, move on. Jesus moved on, because there are those who want to hear. And we should never let ourselves be detained too long by those who simply say no. You know, so Jesus leaves the Gadarenes, crosses back, and is warmly received by these people who had been scouring the horizon, waiting for him to come, watching for that little blip, that little dot, that little picture of a boat, you see, to come back. And they were there on the shore for who knows how long, waiting for him to come back, and they joyfully receive him. So that's the picture. And look, Luke says, there came a man named Jairus, 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 and this one was a ruler of the synagogue. This is one of the relatively few times that a personal name is attached. We didn't hear a name for the woman who was washing the feet of Jesus with her tears and so on. Oftentimes these people come in and pass through the scene and are left more or less anonymous. But this man is named, probably because he was an important individual. He was Jairus. There might even be some name recognition among the people who would eventually read the Gospel of Luke. He was a ruler of the synagogue. This is the first time in Luke that somebody from the upper echelons of the Jewish culture, Jewish society, come to Jesus favorably. Jesus has dealt with leaders. He's dealt with people who were kind of the upper crust, but for the most, well, up until this point, they have all been negative. 
These have all been negative encounters. Here's the first time a man comes who has prestige, who has honor in the community. He's a synagogue leader. That's a fairly elevated status. And he comes, of course, pleading with Jesus for a favor, for a benefit. It's the first time it's happened. It speaks to the idea that gradually, of course, Jesus and his message are reaching more and more deeply into, the, uh, into every tier, as it were, of the Jewish world at that time. The fact that he was a synagogue ruler is to say that he had been elected by the elders associated with that fairly major synagogue, presumably Capernaum, and that means that he was a man who was, was respected and honored and viewed as someone of unimpeachable integrity and knowledge and wisdom, and so he had this particular favorable status. He's called a ruler. He was more something like an MC, you know, but he was the one who would oversee the operations of the synagogue, that kind of thing. But sometimes you can be a ruler and still be helpless, and that's the problem with our poor Jairus. He's a ruler, but now he's also a father, and in connection with his father role that he has, he has no power. His rule is not going to help him, and so he comes and in spite of his status, is willing to prostrate himself and humble himself, not embarrassed in doing so, because the desire of his heart overrules any concern he has for reputation. And so he comes, and we have this remarkable description. This one was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling before the feet of Jesus... He besought him to come into his house. So he's in two roles. He's a ruler and a father. And we're impressed by the fact that a ruler will engage in this kind of prostration before Christ because of his concern for his daughter. Luke tells us uh, his daughter, and then he adds his only begotten to him, was about 12 years old, and she was at the point of death. Only Luke tells us that the daughter was his only child. The word he uses here is monogenes. It's the same word that's used to describe Christ as the only begotten son of the father. It's a word that stands for deeply cherished. I mean, I think most of us in this room are parents. Many of us are grandparents. And we know that children have a special place in your heart, unlike any other, a deep abiding concern for your child. You know, it's wired in there and right that it should be. But even more, when it's your only child, there's a kind of intensity of affection that's all vested in that one person. And Luke adds that. Matthew doesn't mention it. Mark doesn't mention it. And I, re I think the reason for that is because Luke um, is the one who has the human touch. I have to say, can, I, can we just keep this between us? I like Luke the best. I, you know, I mean, no offense to Matthew, but Matthew's always struck me as a little stuffy. I mean, he kind of writes like in a, as a CPA, you know, he kind of, no offense, you CPAs, you know what I'm saying? But uh, he's just a little bit kind of stuffy. Mark, I feel like Mark appeals to the athletes in the room. He's, he's the guy that's always wanting to go out and play touch football. And, you know, He's always action, always moving, always loud, always rambunctious, and that kind of, I've never been athletic. That, that's not my deal either, but Luke, Luke is so human and so sensitive. You just see the little details. I really do believe the man was a physician, and I think he dealt with, you know, patients who had been the only child, and he knew the feeling that you, f you have as you're trying to help someone who may be in a desperate situation because of the welfare of a child. I, I really think Luke was, was sensing that as he told the story. So anyway, for whatever it's worth. Uh, so this was his only 12-year-old uh, daughter. Of course, we have the number 12 here twice, don't we? It's very tempting. I wish I could find some deep theological significance to the fact that the girl was 12 years old and the woman had been riddled with this problem for 12 years. Believe me, there have been plenty of theories. I'm not going to trouble you with them because they're so ridiculous, you know, but uh, 
Uh, I just think it's a coincidence, a bit of a providential coincidence. It does help us remember the two stories, keep them together. I think that's part of how it served a purpose. It is interesting to me, although I don't want to really go anywhere with this, but you notice how when we say 12 years old with reference to the girl, it's a fairly short time. She has her whole life ahead of her. She's only 12. It's just a child. But when it's the woman's been suffering for 12 years, it's a long time, isn't it? Isn't that interesting how the 12 kind of has a different sense depending on how it uh, shows up here. But anyway, beyond that, I'll leave it to your fruitful imaginations what that may uh, signify. I think it just means that this is the way it worked. The, the girl was 12 and the woman had been suffering for 12 years. Jesus uh, was following, and the crowd was pressing him. This is sort of like rock star treatment, you know. Jesus is moving along uh, in this crowd, and he's going to the house of the synagogue ruler, and the crowd just wants to get a piece of him, the way people can sometimes be when they're around someone who's a celebrity. They just want to touch him. They want to get a little piece of him, a little thread from his cloak or something like that, you know, how we tend to be that way with people that are superstars. And that's the kind of treatment Jesus is getting. This is kind of the high point of his ministry, high popularity. Everybody wants to see him. Everyone gets to get close to him. And so the crowd is sort of, you know, closing in on him and making even probably walking along a little bit difficult. And so that's the picture we have. And then in that setting, then we have this interesting description of a woman. There was a gune, a woman. Literally, it reads, being in flow of blood from 12 years, from which no one was able to heal her. So a couple of details here. Uh, The commentaries I've looked at on this are virtually, in fact, I think they are unanimous, that what this woman is suffering from, and indeed the language Luke uses here, while it's not exactly technical medical language of the first century, leaves virtually no doubt that what she's suffering from is a kind of problem with her menstrual flow. You know, I mean, that's the deal. And obviously that's supposed to, in the normal course of events, happen about once a month. You all, I won't go into that. If you don't know about that, ask your mother, you know, but... uh, in any event, uh, here we have a woman who has been in, in uh, horrific circumstances. First of all, because she has this problem that has just been plaguing her now for 12 solid years. And that in itself, of course, would be a, lot, uh, you know, a fair amount of misery. Uh, there's ill health that comes, there's weakness, there's susceptibility to other problems and so on, and all of that has been plaguing her. And on top of that, she is also, based on the uh, standards and regulations of the Jewish, cent- uh, Jewish c- uh, culture of the first century, uh, viewed as ceremonially unclean. Now, this doesn't simply apply to, you know, the menstrual cycle, any kind of bodily uh, issue of fluid. There's all kinds of detail of this in the book of Leviticus. Renders a person unclean, and it means they have to go through a certain amount of kind of, you know, regulatory washing and so on in order to be restored to a state of ceremonial purity so that they can approach the temple and, and so on. When a person is unclean, they were not supposed to be in contact with others. They were supposed to be in isolation. This woman is acting illegally right now. She is not supposed to be in the crowd because under the rules of the Old Testament, anyone who touched her and anyone that she touched, even unwittingly, was going to be contaminated by having come in contact with someone who's unclean. So she knows that she's out on a limb. She's feeling that already. She does not want to be discovered, you know. We don't know how well-known she was in the community. Uh, Obviously, Capernaum was a good-sized town, but not that big. There's a good chance that people knew who she was. And so maybe she covered herself, but for whatever reason, this this is stealth. She is under the radar. And think about what she has to go through. She's in a crowd, and everyone wants to touch Jesus. She's having to kind of muscle her way through this, you know. And boy, what a, you know, what was in her mind to do this? She believes that maybe if she can just kind of touch Jesus, doesn't want to be discovered, just touch him maybe. She's way too embarrassed to tap him on the shoulder and say, here's my problem, could you heal me? Oh, she'd never do that. You know. 
But she's hoping maybe just this touch is going to be the means of her healing. So she comes, she has this problem. Now, another little note. Some of you may have Bibles that either include in the text of verse 43 or a footnote that says something like this. She had spent all her live, living on physicians. How many of you have something like that in your text? All right. That little phrase does not occur, most likely, in Luke's original version. Uh, it is a probably, I, mean, I think the best theory is that an early copyist inserted that as a marginal note based on something that Mark says. And then somehow or other it got you know, read into the text, and so it shows up as, as in some of the earlier manuscripts, but not the best ones. Mark is very harsh. Mark says something like this. She had spent all her living on doctors and had not only gotten, not gotten better, but gotten worse for it, you know. Very hard on doctors. Very, very difficult there, you know. Luke is a doctor. <laughs> Ever heard of professional courtesy? You know, he goes... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute here, you know. Uh, Luke understands that that's part of the story, but he just discreetly leaves it out. Uh, and I think, again, it's because Luke is a physician, and he knows that, you know, just because you're a doctor doesn't mean you can fix everything that walks in the door. That sometimes there are problems, tragically, that are simply beyond the powers of the healing arts. I used to have this, you know, to some degree of practicing law. I'd have people come in in horrific messes, and they want me to fix it. And all I could do was look at them and say, you know, there's not much I can do here, really. You know, this, you've, you've got yourself in a real jam, and I mean, we can do some things, but there's no slick answers. And even more, I think, you know, the physicians face that situation sometimes, just have to give the bad news. Uh, but in any event, Luke, uh, Luke probably did not say that, but uh, he did mention that she had found no one who could provide for her healing. All right, so what happens? Verse 44, she approached from behind, it's important not to be discovered, and touched the edge or the hem or the tassel. It, it could go several ways, but the, the point of the word is to say barely touched like just touching the sleeve or something, that would be the force of it, of his garment. And immediately, the flow of her blood was stopped. She knew immediately that something had happened, you see, which must have been a kind of terrifying and joyful moment for her that she knew something had happened to her. She's hoping, of course, now to turn around and sneak out. <laughs> like finding a little treasure. She's hoping that, you know, she'll just be able to escape and contemplate on this later, but no such luck for her. And Jesus said, who touched me? Can you imagine her terror? She just reaches out and touches him. She knows something's happened, and immediately he stops. <laughs> who touched me? <laughs> Can you imagine? That'd be enough for heart failure right on the spot. Just the, the, the stark terror of having that happen. Who touched me? Well, Peter, of course. Well, everybody protests. This is funny in, in the way it reads here. Everybody denied it. It's sort of like when you walk in and there's spilled milk and there's six kids. <laughs> not me, not me, not me. You know, six kids didn't do it. But how did, you know, you wonder, how do these things happen? And uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> So uh, anyway, it's like all these kids deny. I didn't touch it. Nope, not me. Was it you? No. And so everybody's denying it, uh, even though Jesus has been just pressed and thronged by these people uh, now for all of these, uh, you know, all these paces he's been taking along the way. Peter speaks up and says, Lord, the crowd is pressing and thronging you. Now, again, Mark is a little bit more raw. Uh, Mark has Peter almost to the verge of sarcasm because he adds this. He says, Lord, the crowd has been pressing and thronging you and you're asking who touch you? You know, it's sort of a little bit of an insult there. Um, and that's the way Mark is. He's a little bit more, he's probably somewhat more truthful to what actually happened. But uh, it does uh, 
uh, leave us with this kind of, you know, of course, Peter uh, apparently was the, was the guy who was the source of the stories as reported by Mark. At least traditionally, the church has understood Mark is recording the memoirs of Peter. And if you read Mark, you notice Peter often comes out looking pretty bad. He's very self-effacing, you know. Once again, Peter was the jerk in the situation, and so you, you, know, you kind of get the feeling that, that Peter wants to uh, make that real clear, what a bozo he was on occasion. But in any event, uh, Luke discreetly leaves that out and simply has Peter asking uh, the question, well, look, Master, the, the crowd's been pressing you and thronging you. Uh, and then Jesus says, this, of course, is the most intriguing and profound and mysterious verse in the whole account. He says, someone touched me because I, and the word that's used here is knew, I knew or know, uh, often translated felt, which would be okay, power, dunamen, as in dynamite, that kind of power, power went out from me. And that is, of course, where we pause and we just wonder, what is that exactly? All of these people had been touching him. Everyone wanted a little piece of Jesus, you know, and they were trying to get a little contact with him and so on. And all of a sudden, one hand, one finger, reaches out of the crowd and just touches him. And he knows it. Power goes out. And, of course, we hear that and we think, well, there was something different about that touch. What was that? And we're we're advised as the story unfolds that the thing that was different was that this was a touch of faith. But what kind of faith was it? You would have to say, and in fact, you know, quite a few commentators note this borders on a kind of superstitious faith. You know, this is not the way you normally do it. Uh, this is really at the edges, at the, at the very borders of, you know, the right way to come to Jesus, just hoping to touch his garment. In fact, Matthew seems so concerned about telling the story this way that he doesn't have the woman healed until after Jesus turns around and pronounces her healed, you know. Uh, but probably Luke and Mark are a little closer to the mark here, that, it's, that she was healed at the moment of touch. And so what does that say to us? Generally, it's taken as a great affirmation that Christ's ministry among his people, his ministry in the church, if you can read the invisible ink here, his ministry in the church is in part a ministry of touch. You know, This is one of the great things about how we come to church, not only to hear the word of God, but as it were to be touched by Christ and the sacrament is simply a fancy word for touch. It's Christ reaching out and contacting us in our fleshly, earthy kind of existence, because we need that. How much do we need human contact? How often do we shake hands? How often do we embrace? How often do we need that kind of physical contact? How important is it sometimes for the pastor to not just say a word, but to touch, you know? Uh, All through the history of the church, the laying on of hands, the touching, has been such an important part of it. So I think while the sacrament is not mentioned here specifically, the commentators are generally correct to say that part of the lesson of this is that as we come to church and as we come to worship, we should come something like this woman. When, you know, you go forward in church and you reach out, maybe you break off a little piece of the bread or however it may, we should almost be like that woman, reaching out, as if, to be t- as if touching the hem of Jesus' garment. And as we do so in faith, power goes out. That there's something that really does happen. In the, it's not just a memorial. It's not just a nice thought. That this is something where there's actual, you know, infusion of his grace into our lives. It's called a means of grace. Uh, to be honest with you, that wasn't my own kind of Baptist background. It was treated more as a memorial. This is, this is more Presbyterian. I've had to kind of learn this a little bit over the years. But I do think it's the spirit of the New Testament. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, you know, uh, uh, 12, 11, uh, first, 11, those who eat the body and blood of Christ unworthily 
eat and drink judgment to themselves. There's a power in the sacrament that can be negative if we come in a way that isn't appropriately worshipful. On the other hand, when we come by faith, there's a great positive you know, benefit that comes to us. And so at least it, it seems in part that's what's going on. The other little subtlety here that's equally mysterious, and I just kind of, with you, look into the mystery of this at a distance, but what, was, what did Jesus feel? He said, I felt power go out from me. What, did he get weak in the knees? What happened there exactly? You know. There is an idea, I think you can argue it pretty successfully biblically, that when Jesus healed, when he healed the sick, while he gave health, he at the same time absorbed somehow into himself the, the weakness, the sickness. He felt it. In other words, there was some kind of labor in this. We hear in the Old Testament, by his stripes we are healed. The culminating expression of this is the cross, where Jesus does heal us most deeply. But at what cost? As he goes through the agonies, you see there of the cross and, and all of what he absorbed in himself. Well, maybe in a lesser degree, every time he healed someone, he felt something of that. He had to take into himself something of the pain, you know. We hear in the New Testament that after he'd been involved in healing for a while, he had to go rest, like it took it out of him, you know. Uh, in the New Testament, we're told that Jesus is our high priest, and in Hebrews, we hear that he's not a priest who doesn't feel with us our infirmities. He's touched with us in our grief. So when we go through painful experiences, traumas, hard times, we come to Jesus with those. He feels that with us, you see. And he gives us grace in exchange for our pain. He gives us strength in the face of these difficulties. When Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus, Jesus confronts him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Not my people. Me. Jesus was being persecuted by Paul in his people, you see. And so it's, it's a subtle idea, but it, it, it says somehow that, you know, here's Jesus who almost involuntarily is the impression of the text heals and power goes on and he feels it. What was that? You know. Anyway, I'll let you speculate on that. But uh, the idea is that uh, he returns. And, and of course, she, this is a great statement now, seeing, the woman seeing that she could not be hid. That's powerful language. She could not be hid. Trembling came and fell before him and explained why she had touched him and how she had been healed, and very important, explained before the crowd. And again, this seems very liturgical. It seems that Luke is wanting to say to us, you know, you can come to Christ, in a sense, in secret. You can come surreptitiously, on the sly, as it were. But if you're really going to come to Christ, sooner or later, it's got to come out. Sooner or later, you're going to be in front of the crowd and announcing. That's why when people join the church, we don't let them do it just quietly in the pastor's study, sign a little piece of paper, and that's it. You have to stand up in front of everybody and be asked the questions, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Answer, yes, I do. You know, uh, and Do you intend to renounce sin and follow him? Yes, I do. That's a public thing. Some people get real nervous getting up in front of folks. But you know what? It's good for us. It's only then that Jesus gives her the word of assurance. In a sense, assurance of salvation comes as we go public with our faith. That's when we get this great sense that, you know, this is for real. Private faith, secret faith, mystery faith, hidden in a closet. It, you know, it can be faith, but it'll never give you that sense of, of confidence. Jesus isn't going to leave you there. You may come in secret, but he's going to make it wide open. He doesn't do this to punish the woman. This isn't some kind of, you know, some kind of rite of passage or some such thing. It's good for her. And so even though she came in secret, now the, the announcement is made. It reminds me, if you don't mind me being slightly personal here, it reminds me of when I first came to this church. 
1980. I came kind of like this woman. I was under the radar. I didn't want anyone to know I was here. I'm not going to go. I'm not bore you with the details. Most of you know this story, but you know it was a it was a difficult time, a somewhat dark time in my life. And I didn't want anyone to know who I was. I just wanted to sneak into a back pew because I wanted to be somewhere near God's people. And that's it. And you know what? It was fine. But Jesus was not willing to leave me there. Doggone it. And he sent people like Earlene Cochran and Randy Steele and, you know, all of these wonderful people that were, some of you know them from years back, and, and they just kind of grabbed me by the nap of the neck and said, okay, pal, you know, you're not staying there on that back pew. Look at me. Here I am today, you know. Just <laughs> So uh, that's the way it works. That's the way it works. And it works that way for every one of us. If you're really going to come to Christ, it's going to go public. And it's right that it should be. When Jesus said to his disciples, wait in Jerusalem for the power of the Spirit, and you will be my, what? Witnesses. That's a public role, you see. That's out front. And then since that's what this woman is uh, being uh, given here. So he said to her daughter, and notice this, very interesting, your faith has saved you, not healed you. Both of these stories use the word saved you. He says that to the synagogue ruler about his daughter, and he says it to this woman, and that's no accident, that's quite intentional, that the salvation that comes through the ministry of the church is by word and sacrament, it's by the preaching of the gospel, and the touch that comes, you see, through his broken body and shed blood, and that that for us is this great, wonderful uh, healing, restoring power that leads us to uh, conformity to Christ. All right. So uh, now we go on from there. While he was yet speaking, someone from, came from the synagogue ruler's house saying, your daughter is dead. No longer trouble the teacher. Can you imagine the vexation this synagogue ruler Jairus was going through at this delay? I mean, he's frustrated enough with the crowd. He'd like to be going on a dead sprint you know, down the road to his daughter because she's in such grave circumstances. Every second counts. And he's trying to, you know, politely with some degree of modesty and dignity and so on, trying to get, you know, this, this Jesus down to his house. And all of a sudden, this whole little story interrupts. And he's just standing there going, ah. can you imagine you know, what he's going through, kind of this anxiety? And then his worst fears are confirmed. They're too late. Uh, the daughter has died. And, of course, at least the impression is that he would, at that point, despair. We were hoping Jesus could get there in time. He has no concept of the resurrection of the dead now. That's probably not even in his mind. He thinks uh, it's all over. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. There is a little humor in that. Teachers can't do much. If Jesus were only a teacher then it would be all over. If, only, if all Jesus could do was give a good Sunday school lesson, then he would be as helpless as anyone else in the face of death. LBJ was famous for saying, those who can, do. Those who can't, teach. <laughs> you know. Believe me, I identify with that. I'm telling you. I've always, I've always said, you know, I, I love these people who go out and do constructive things in the third world. I used to joke about that as a lawyer, you know. You take a lawyer out, you know, you take a doctor out there or a contractor, they can do something. What does a lawyer do? You know, here, you want to sue somebody? You know, what, do you, what do you want to do? You know, let me give you my card. What is this? The, 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 the lawyer is helpless. And in my case, it's doubly so, because I'm, I'm so incompetent with, uh, as my wife well knows, uh, you know, with uh, handy, hand me a hammer and I'm dangerous. And so I just... Uh, <laughs> I really feel that. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. He won't help you, you know, kind of thing. But happily for him and happily for us, Jesus was not less than a teacher, but infinitely more than a teacher. And so he says, Jesus uh, answered saying, do not fear, me phobo, do not fear, only believe. Deep faith chases out deep fear. Monon Pistusan, only believe. The Bible never says in so many words, 
that we are justified by faith alone. Never says that. The Catholic Church has always pointed that out with some degree of zeal, you know. The Bible never, but the Bible sends us that message repeatedly, and this is only one of many occasions. Only believe, you know. Jairus, I know it looks dark, just trust me. Only believe. And let that faith displace the fear that's welling up right now inside you. Only believe, and she will be saved, is the word that's used there. So, entering into the house, he did not permit anyone to go in with him except Peter and James and John and the father of the child and the mother. Jesus doesn't do miracle for spectacle. We see that again and again. Certainly, his miracles prove his authority and prove the claims he makes of himself, but he never does it just for the show, like a three-ring circus. And now watch this, boom, you know, it's not, not that kind of thing at all. And so the miracles are performed undeniably, but modestly. And in this case, he's not trying to make a show out of it. He restricts access into the inner sanctum here of this healing uh, to those who are most interested in it, his three inner circle disciples and the father and mother. Taking, um, uh, uh, oh, there was weeping. Everybody was weeping and wailing for her. Obviously, they had been in the room, they had seen the light go out, they'd seen the skin turn pale, they'd seen the breathing stop, they knew she was dead. And they're weeping in the ancient Near Eastern custom to really give you know, <coughs> expression to this, uh, weeping and wailing. And uh, Jesus says, do not weep, for she's not dead, but only sleeps. And then this seems very brutal, and they laughed him to scorn. And it sounds, I mean, I think our first impulse is to be quite cynical about these people, you know, to go from weeping to just this kind of laughter to scorn. I, I think, and I, now I'm, this is just my speculation, so I'm, for what, it, this is in the, for what it's worth department, as Paul Harvey would say. Um, I think we should be a little bit more sympathetic to these people. I don't know if you've had this experience. I have from time to time had the experience of somebody who was gravely ill, you know, and approaching death. And we can always wish that some, such a person would be healed. And certainly God can do that and sometimes does. But I've been in situations where someone was gravely ill, approaching death, and some dear saint comes up and says, I think God's going to heal you. And it's all kind of like this glib, almost sort of cheap confidence in the face of someone's grave illness. And then, in fact, they don't get healed. They do die, you know. And you, you sort of feel a little pain for that, don't you? You just feel like, wait a minute. I mean, it would be wonderful for God to heal. But, but this sort of just kind of superficial confidence saying to this person, giving them false hope about something that may or may not actually happen is a little bit cruel. It just, is, it, you know, I think that's probably what these people were feeling. Who does this guy, she's dead. She, she's not breathing, she's dead. What do you mean she's sleeping? We were just there, we saw her, we tried CPR, it didn't work, she's dead. You know, and now Jesus, oh no, she's just sleeping. And they're going, wait a minute. And, and almost, in, almost in sympathy for the parents, they want to kind of minimize the, effect of what Jesus has said. Now, I don't know if that's correct. So you can just give that some thought. But it's, it occurs to me that maybe that's something what's going on. In any event, uh, they knew she was dead. He, however, now in this inner room, took her by the hand and said, notice emphasis on said, child arise and her breath returned her pneuma, her spirit, or her breath, either one. And immediately she stood up, and he said, you know, get her a hamburger. She's hungry. That's what 12-year-olds eat, I think. Just like that, the word. And again, it tells us, in the church, that's how Christ ministers to us. Word and sacrament. Word and touch. The function of the sacrament in the ministry of the church is to confirm the word. Calvin said the sacrament comes secondary as a sign and a seal. 
We don't go into church just for the sacrament. We go in to hear the sermon, but then the purpose of the sacrament is to, as it were, be a moment when God shakes hands with us, confirms its truth, assures us that he is actually in these words and making them real to us. Uh, so word and sacrament, it seems that those two are being highlighted here in this story. And uh, the parents were stunned, and I'm, I've added the thought with joy. They were astonished. It's a strong word. I can only imagine their astonishment. And then he said to them, oh, don't tell anybody what happened. You know, that's the uh, kind of little punchline humor in the thing. Uh, uh, yeah, everybody, she was just taking a nap. Uh, that's all it was, uh, you know. No, they, but, but of course, the whole reason Jesus says something like that is, is not because he expects this to remain some sort of uh, dark secret, but, but uh, he doesn't want this to become the centerpiece. He's, he's not trying to become a sort of bandwagon, uh, you know, hero in that sense, because what he's about, his mission is about something vastly more profound than even what's happened here. But it certainly confirms uh, the truth of who he is and the truth of his claims. And it's a great story to encourage us, don't you think? Well, thank you so much uh, for your kind attention. Let's close in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for these wonderful accounts. A woman who comes and is healed by the mere touch of the hem of your garment. And this little girl who seems beyond hope, who was raised from death by the power of your word. And we give you thanks that, in a sense, as even now we enter into a time of worship, we can anticipate that remarkable experience of word and touch, which are intended to strengthen us, give us courage, give us hope, give us faith, give us assurance. And for all these things, we give you thanks in the name of Christ. Amen.